And um, that we have to admit a kind of uh, um, an indeterminacy, okay, an indeterminacy about uh, what will happen and the kinds of, you know, the, the, the consequences of the, uh, uh, you know, the practical struggles in which people are engaged in. Okay, so um, there's a lot in uh, Dimitri's text with which I agree. Um, so let, let me kind of think, just focus on. Uh, you know, points where I think there's, you know, there is a kind of substantive disagreement, okay? Um, so first, well, there's, okay, let's say there's three um, crucial points. One is the, the nature, there's a kind of uh, a disagreement over whether the primacy of struggle or conflict as against decision, decision classification. That's, I think, that one central criticism of the Mitra's text. Secondly, um, whether uh, transformation um, is should be primarily anchored in struggle um, or some kind of um, theoretical cognition, and finally, um, the you know the, the claim that acquisition is simply kind of collapses into kind of you know really conservative, uh, uh, completely reactionary appeal, kind of you know classical kind of bourgeois legalism. A bourgeois universalism, okay, which is incapable of acknowledging the, way to, the extent to which you know capitalism um, is you know kind of completely predetermined um, the uh, the way in which we understand what it is to be human, um, what what rights are, what statehoods are, etc., um, etc. Et okay, so first, um, um, well, one. Point is that uh, well, first of all, there's a the first criticism seems to be that um, the way in which I articulate, you know, cognitive and social abstraction um, is presupposes some kind of um, cognitive discrimination, ultimately moral evaluation between allegedly good and bad abstraction or emancipatory reactionary abstraction, um, and this is our read so Nietzsche writes. No, this, this is a quote. The problem with this assumption is not that it is ethical, but that it implies a theoretical decision that predates a revolutionary moment, and in doing so, it preempts the multiplicity of this present conflict that are unleashed in a struggle, reducing them into rational decision making to be carried out today, using intellectual chaos of a particular background and social experience. Uh, and being reductive of such multiplicity, this is also a preemptive act of power. Um, so, um, well, first of all, I mean, I think, uh, I think this collapse of cognitive discrimination of the moral evaluation is, a, is slightly hasty. Um, because I think, you know, all I'm saying is basically, and I perhaps, you know, the terms we've been back are obviously kind of, you know, undesirable because they, they invite this kind of uh, interpretation. But the, you know, the, the key thing is simply that knowing what something is and how it works. Is necessary in order to, to help us to change it. And that the danger is that delegating determinations to the vicissitudes of struggle and conflict without some form of preliminary cognitive arbitration uh, is sounds like, you know, it's, it's doomed to kind of uh, to lapse into a kind of uh, empiricist practices. Okay? Um, so, I mean, I agree, and so basically the thing is, I guess, I, it's, it's certainly the case that theory is constitutively incapable of uh, predicting, of telling us what to do, you know, how to go about, um, you know, um, practical transformations. There's always going to be a short for discrepancy between the, what the theory said should be done and what actually has to be done. Okay, but then it seems that the claim that no kind of, uh, you know, um, the claim that kind of, you know, positive accounts of uh, what can be achieved by cognitive abstraction um, is the claim that a positive account of abstraction based on an understanding of the mechanisms um, through which. Um, 
how it's perpetuated and reiterated um, is, I think, um, maybe it's, 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 it's kind of excessive or, so, or an overreaction. Okay? Um, because um, this ties into the question, like, what, um, what it means to abolish the question of abolition, and that's um, when I talk about, you know, the famous quote from, uh, from Marx about, you know, communism is a real movement that abolishes the present state of things, okay? Well, um, the question is about, can we give this, is it possible to inflect or determine this abolition? Okay? Or is it entirely something that, has, that can only be negotiated in a clear set of peace you know, kind of, uh, you know, discrete, you know, spatial temporary discontinuous instance? Well, the, the translator, a friend, a German translator of uh, of the uh, abstraction test, or more, in the German, in Marx's German text, he uses the word behavior. He uses the Hegelian term, determine the game. So it's about the aim is that you know, communism is the movement that is that determinately negates the present state of things. Okay. Um, so if it is a question of determinate negation. The question is, what determines the negation? Okay. Who or what determines the negation? Uh, and if the determination is simply kind of relegated to, you know, the, uh, to these objective mechanisms, then it's obviously kind of, uh, there is no, it's not subject to, kind of, to control. Um, um, this is important because I think one thing that makes me Uneasy, I think, is um, the claim that you could have some kind of complete abolition of capital. You know? I, I, I'm not sure I understand what that actually means. Okay? I don't understand what it means to have um, an absolute transformation. Um, in other words, an indeterminate negation. Um, and I think that's and you know that sounds well. It's very I find it difficult to make sense of, and it sounds ultimately you know metaphysical and you kind know, of a proper text. It's more a wholly indeterminate negation. Um, is something that can't be infected um, or you know. Um, Through a set of you know um, organized steps or uh, practices, um, so um, this is why I think this is why I think also that the uh, the valorization of struggle um, independently struggle is not kind of you know a struggle where it's impossible to uh, foresee in advance. Uh, at what point in which struggle could be seen to kind of either to have succeed, to succeed or fail, or to be kind of worth persisting with, etc., etc., et uh, becomes, um, well, becomes, I think, problematic, if not fetishistic. Okay? Struggle alone is not criticism. Okay? And I disagree with the claim that struggle is criticism. Because there's a kind of struggle. Um, a struggle which is incapable of adjudicating the relationship between means and ends, which simply, in one way, can be seen to perpetuate what the struggles against and to preclude the possibility of a radical revolution of transformation. Um, so, uh, I think that, that, okay, so what I want to say is that the permanently fish need not presuppose any idealist dialectic dialectization of history. Okay, and I think, that, again, this is, I think, a false alternative. The idea that, like, if you're talking about determinate negation, uh, you're talking about, you assume that history kind of has this ideological structure. And I think there's, that's actually un entirely unnecessary. And it's based on a kind of punitively reductive caricature of Hegel. Um, which has, which you know, has been challenged by lots of you know scholars. Okay? 
Uh, but the point is not to you know, the point is not about whether this is fair or unfair to Hegel. The point is that it becomes paralyzing. So I think it's, ne it's necessary to insist on the possibility of uh, determining uh, so that it's possible to discriminate between advance and retreat, progress and regress, without subscribing to a metaphysical teleology. Because if we can't, on what basis then do we distinguish between overcoming and perpetuation? If the goal is the overcoming of the present state of things, of capital, then surely we have to be able to identify conditions under which this kind of overcoming would be, or a step towards this overcoming. Okay? Um, I also think that this requires identifying material points of influence. Okay? And this is where I think theory is kind of indispensable. You need to understand how the world works in order to understand where and when to intervene. Okay? Um, now, so this is why I can't accept the claim that there is no positive element of capitalism anywhere. And this is, you know, Demetrius writes this about, you know, um, she claims that, you know, what she rejects in this kind of the, the classic, in the program, this is the kind of the claim that it's simply about, uh, you know, unleashing, you know, if you simply kind of uh, uh, release, you know, allow the forces of production to kind of, uh, you know, to develop to a point where, you know, um, you overcome the, you know, kind of uh, the, the social relations that prevented them from transforming, uh, from facilitating the, you know, the, the, the transformation of society that would usher in the communism. Um, but it's not. No, I'm not saying this to say there are positive elements in capitalism. It's not positive here. It's not. It's not. It's, it's not moral. It's not saying they're good. Or bad. There must be a way of like saying, identifying what is um, indispensable or what could be, um, you know, cognitively and practically repurposed in capitalism, um, without simply then saying that uh, you know to do so is to kind of want to perpetuate the social forms in, in which these um, elements are embedded, because. If there's no positive element whatsoever to be found in capitalism, this, I mean, I find it difficult to see how this is not just a moral evaluation. And doesn't it condemn us then to the, to the phantasmatic annihilation of capitalism? Okay? Capitalism is wholly, is all bad, irredeemable. Okay? Um, then you want to abolish it. You want to push it in the sense of this annihilation. Okay? Um, and it's the point is that, well, how would this annihilation happen? And the problem with this account is that you end up with this kind of, you know, negative eschatology where, since it's difficult to see how we could abolish capitalism, we hope that nature will do it for us. That ecological catastrophe kind of bring about some kind of crisis, some disastrous kind of injunction, in which, which will somehow, we know not how, uh, lead to um, the advent of something resembling you know, okay. um, So, uh, this is why I'm not sure why you don't believe in the term negation. Um, and if you, well, once you, it's, it's one thing to deserve the certainty, the programmatic certainty of the open capitalism, but on, on what basis would you hold on to the possibility of? Of the overcoming, okay. Um, so it's certain, it's clear that he can't live certainly overcome, but a practicism predicated on the absolute primacy of, let's say, agonism or like just struggle. Uh, you know, the idea is that you no know, struggle comes first, and then we kind of figure out, you know, how to articulate these struggles. It's not clear how this could even assume the practical possibility of transformation. It can only hope. For its indeterminate advent. And of course, this is the appeal to some of the event, okay? something, some extra systemic force or agency which precipitates the, the, uh, the radical pick. Um, moreover, if we cannot somehow measure the extent to which such an advent reconfigures the horizon of possibility, then how can we act upon it? Possibilities are rooted in material structures. Okay? Um, and it's important, you know, there are things that you can and can't do, you know, 
can't join Burrow to pick. You'll never build a set out of that pools. And uh, the reasons to assume that this is the and the reason why this is so seems to have little to do with practice. And now, okay, call this common sense. Um, I first, I would I, I think uh, you know the, 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 the habitual denunciation of common sense becomes another kind of you know uh, theoretical common sense. So I think <laughs> well, it's not very really, really uncommon roots of common sense in certain contexts. So while it's important that not uh, what ideological representations of myths or clues about material structures. Um, we have to have some positive experience of what the concluded possibilities are, otherwise how can we even talk of possibilities? If theory is no longer the guarantor of the overcoming of capitalism, whence the conflict and the possibility of its overcoming? Why will it not simply go on for Vacuous possibility is just the theological benediction of incapacity. We don't know how to change it, we don't even know how it could change, we just continue to hope that it will. So, the alternative to theoretical programmatism can't just be, it can't be this kind of, uh, this wholesale relinquishment of the theoretical identification of um, the points of uh, the possibilities, okay, or the potentials, encoded in uh, uh, you know, material points of influence. And this is why these points need to be identified. Um, and this identification is a theoretic task, um, which you know, would then facilitate um, the transformation. Okay, so the identification of these material points of influence, whose transformation might precipitate change, seems to me to presuppose some sort of theoretical description and explanation. No, of course. I mean, I don't know what that, um, you know, you know, what that the, you know, con you know constructing that the is of course a, a huge challenge, and I'm not, you know, I don't know what that theory would be. So, so I think, in other words, I think that while um, recognizing, you know, the uh, in a way the kind of the anachronistic kind of kind of classical programmatism is, is entirely kind of uh, necessary and a good thing, it's a, it's a kind of, in fact it's indispensable. Um, I think that there's kind of, a, there's an overreaction and the overreaction seems to be the kind of the valorization of a kind of, you know, a kind of indeterminacy or a kind of uh, what I've called imperative practices. In other words, we, you know, we, have, we struggle um, and then we, we don't pretend to kind of, uh, or we, we just, you know, then try and, you know, construct or elaborate some kind of, you know, theory on the basis of, uh, of these struggles. Um, so, it's so all this to say that this is why I don't accept the idea, first of all, because I don't accept that struggle is criticism. I don't think it is, uh, it's, it, it suffices as criticism, okay? And secondly, um, I think that criticism is a, a normative term. Uh, criticism is a normative term, and it's not clear that, you know, the claim is that kind of, you know, rationality is, you know, one of the things that needs to be kind of subjected to kind of wholesale pretty well. Two things, it depends what kind of concept of rationality you're working with. And generally, from what experts were talking about, does a critique of rationality proceed? The 20th century critiques of rationality, which are philosophical, um, seem to me to be, you know, ideological through and through. Bergson, Spideggers, even Adorno and Horkheimer's, or those found in post-structuralism. Yeah. And they all involve, you know, a kind of, uh, well, a straightforward, you know, philosophical caricature, of rationality, its reduction to calculation, you know, identification, instrumentalization, etc., etc. Okay. Um, so I think that that is. Uh, there are other ways of understanding rationality which don't involve its inflation into some kind of supernatural faculty 
that mysteriously distinguishes humans from other animals on the one hand, and that don't involve um, this kind of, uh, either, I think, the unnecessarily metaphysical interpretation of Hegel, where uh, it's claimed that reality is self production structure. Now, I don't think that that's, I don't think that it was um, committed to that claim, notion, which it's habitually understood. Um, and nor can, you know, nor can you simply have a kind of uh, a face-off between instrument reason, objective reason. You know, Horkheimer you know, contrasts, you know, instrumental rationality and what he calls objective reason. Um, but the objective reason he invokes seems to be rooted in a kind of, in, um, you know, the classical, that kind of, kind of uh, the rationality itself as a kind of, uh, is encoded in you know, objective reality. Uh, and it's, it's striking that this is the claim, traditional claim of idealism, you know, whether it's Plato's idealism, but also kind of you know, Aristotelian idealism. Um, I think there's no, you know, we don't have to settle for either, for either instrumental rationality or so called objective rationality. It's a choice between Hobbes and Aristotle. Okay? So why more revolution practices okay, then to this? Um, you know, do the standoff between um, two equally unsatisfactory kind of um, you know utilitarianism on one hand and Aristotelianism on the other hand. Okay, so uh, when I talk about reason, okay, I I mean reasoning is a socially embedded discursive practice. Okay, what some philosophers call the game of being asking for reasons. And this is simply something that human beings do, okay? Um, and philosophy, you know, can, you know, produces or elaborates a kind of, uh, this kind of uh, formalization of it, um, a conceptual formalization, not a mathematical or logical formalization. Okay? It's important to, uh, to emphasize this. Um, uh, and reason on this account, reason understood as a discursive practice, um, actually explains logic itself. Uh, you know, the formula, the formal inferences that are kind of studied by uh, in logic as being already as already presupposing um, this uh, stratum, this discursive stratum. In other words, so that the power of this account is that uh, conceptual rationality is embedded in social practice and that uh, even the, uh, uh, the, the elementary uh, operations which are kind of codified in logic are themselves merely the explicitation of um, relations of material inference um, that are already uh, embodied in assertion. Assertions, you know, kind of straightforward assertions about. It. So, this to say that um, I don't think that uh, this conception of reason, of what reason is, is either metaphysical um, or you know objectively or objectionably ideals. Okay, that um, will be criticised, but um, and many philosophers, you know, have criticised it and think it's. You know, it's wrong, but um, but at least you can't simply then say, well, we know what reason is, and we know that reason is just you know um, this kind of uh, you know this punitive, totalizing um, instrument that swallows everything up in the uh, you know the undifferentiated concept. Um, um, okay, and then. This is where I think I'd like to say something about um, you know the objection that the uh, the only kind of uh, universalism that can be generated by this kind of discursive this ultimately you know this conception of rationality that's in depth that Kant and Hegel in a way science proposes conception of rationality non physical rationality is primarily discursive. And then Hegel shows how 
discursive rationality is socially embedded. Okay, so that in a way, the conception of rationality I cleave to is ultimately Hegelian. Hegelian in a kind of a, a non metaphysical sense. Um, but the claim of this is that this you know, Hegelian conception of rationality is ultimately kind of reactionary because it's simply, well, not a problem, you know, it's simply the kind of uh, the codification of bourgeois property relations, okay? And that things like, uh, you know, impersonality, impersonality, objectivity, um, obligation, um, you know, responsibility, etc. All the terms in which, for instance, kind of, as also like Robert Brandon characterizes the source of rationality are merely, uh, you know, the, uh, the abstract kind of codification of bourgeois kind of uh, property relations. Okay. Um, well, I have a couple of things to say here. Well, one, first thing I'll say is that um, it's true that I think that there is that's the way in which, uh, you know, the, uh, the philosophical discourse um, that of inspiration from the kind of anti-mediate kind of is a kind of, has been a kind of, uh, uh, you know, an ideological level for liberalism. Okay. Of also like Robert Pittman, it's this line is clearly defining a kind of uh, you know liberalism, liberal kind of social democracy, etc. Um, but there's a point here again okay, about this particular approach. Okay. Um, which is to say that uh, the fact that discursive self-consciousness, you know, the kind of discursive self-consciousness which a philosopher like Hegel um, what, you know, systematically elaborates you know, in the books, if they're not larger, is, might be causally anchored in pre-discursive social structures, right, class relations, does not suffice to disqualify its rationality as versus self-consciousness, or not unless one is already committed to the claim that the irrationality of the cause vitiates the rationality of the reason. Okay? And this is a claim whose subversive force relies on what I think is a metaphysical identification of discursive reasons with their non-rational causes. So in other words, that particular argument I find unpersuasive, okay? It collapses reasons into causes. It says that you know, uh, what Kant and Hegel are talking about is caused by class structures, therefore that is, um, you know, the, the, the content is um, constituted by, this, I mean, it can be flattened onto this kind of, uh, you know, uh, a rational form of concept. And I think that that is a dubious argument which I reject. So I think that that is, you know, I, I, I just don't accept a kind of thing that um, discursive rationality is always simply a kind of, you know, this ideological kind of uh, um, excrescence of uh, bourgeois property relations. I have a second point to make about the appeal to, uh, to recognition, um, and I think Dimitri appears to, to Richard Gunn's kind of text on recognition, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Um, I mean, this is obviously this is a, a minor point, but it's, I was talking about Hegel. So the claim, you know, Gunn's claim um, is that, uh, and about relevant quote from Dimitri said is that quote a common world. Um, or in other words, a valid external world which would, which would pre-channel recognition into authoritative configurations in which we serve as a shared touchstone to which interacting individuals may refer is just what the play of mutual recognition excludes. The revolutionary demolition of such a world and of the role definitions inherent in this, and of the role of definitions inherent in this, was required to affect the transition from a misrecognitive, the mutually recognitive terrain, and radical insecurity is the sole statute under which mutual recognition can come into being, and through which it can sustain itself. 
Um, well, I, I hear I just, I kind of disagree with Mr. Cameron. I think the claim that interpersonal recognition can proceed independently of a shared world, which is that one social, you know, and natural, which is what assumes that it's possible to reduce the socially instituted norms through which we negotiate, both subjectively and objectively, to interpersonal attributes rooted in freestanding subjectivities. And in this regard, it disregards the constitutive independence between objective statuses and subjective attitudes within some determined social forms. In other words, I, I, I simply don't think that this uh, this account is viable, and I don't think it's a credible reconstruction of Hegel. Uh, and moreover, also, like, I think the appeal to recognition is, is kind of curious because obviously, you know, um, it's, you know, people like, uh, you know, like Zizek have, like, you know, failed against uh, the, you know, the, the claim that, you know, Hegel is all about mutual recognition because. This is you know, one way of uh, one way of kind of propagating this, uh, this this kind of uh, liberal interpretation of Hegel, where it's all about ultimately uh, sociality can be reduced to uh, interpersonality. Okay, and I think that this is tied to the claim that in a way. Sociality is rooted in community, uh, and I think that this is a dubious claim, and I certainly think that Marxists should be kind of wary of it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, finally, I'll just say something about uh, the paradox of self-abolition. Okay, which um, I think there's. I'm not sure if. Um, well, I, I can agree with the claim that um, you know the paradox is only a paradox if you assume that uh, there is no more to um, you know what constitutes us than you know our you know, our position in you know, in the whole network of relations within kind of, you know capitalist society um, and in fact that's I was, the point I was trying to make in the paper is that um, if you distinguish between um, practices and labor, okay, you can dissolve the power, the, you know, the, the alleged paradox, because uh, human practices, you know, always exceed whatever is allegedly kind of subsumed or. Um, you know, uh, engulfed by uh, the machinations of of capital. Um, so in a way, like I, I agree, and with this claim that this, you know, and the uh, one interpretation of the paradox based on the appeal to a saturated subsumption. Um, and I, you know, I want to make it clear that I don't believe that you know such a saturated subsumption um, obtains. Okay. Um, And I think it is, it, it's in one of the, the kind of the, the functions or one of the things that theory should do is give an account of the variety of practices, um, you know, which include, I think, a discursive and cognitive practices to understand um, how uh, these, uh, these practices actually have some traction. In transforming the material, transforming material points of influence through which capital reproduces itself. Okay, so I think that this, um, you know, insisting on, in a way, the fact that you know, um, human practices are not exhaustively kind of uh, you know saturated uh, by the uh, you know by capital, capital self reproduction. It's important to understand how, um, you know, generally the transformative struggle might be um, prosecuted 
uh, but also to understand how um, cognitive practices can play an indispensable role. Because theory means it's, it's, you know, it's a cliche to say that theory is a kind of practice, uh, but in a way, all I'm going to say that reason okay, is a kind of cognitive practice which can play an indispensable role when you're trying to figure out you know, how to precipitate, um, how to effect a real radical transformation. Okay? And what you have to do in order to kind of, to, uh, you know, to engage in, you know, not local transformation, but something that might involve a real, you know, the, the termination of uh, the capitalist social relation. Um, um, okay, there's one, I just have one final point, um, which, uh, yes, one, one final point, just a minor, is that it seems to me um, that if one is willing to assume that social practices are not you know, are not kind of, uh, you know, vegetative, you know, saturated mediation, they're not completely kind of enveloped by capital, then, for instance, why then should we assume that things like, that the, you know, science is a social practice, and science tells us things about the natural world, and about how the natural world works. Now, of course, uh, science is embedded in kind of these, you know, Social forms of capital social relations, and as Dimitri points out, um, most a lot of kind of you know scientific research um, is tied in, in you know to, to profit exploitation etc etc. Fine, okay. um, but it seems to me that this doesn't license a claim such as you know why should we assume, like this is a quote. Um, why should we assume today that in the future survival from moments will have to involve medicine as it exists today? Okay. Um, in other words, you know, why would we assume that what um, contemporary medicine tells us about, you know, how to cure viruses um, would survive after the abolition of, of capital? Well, I think um, there's very good reason. I mean, to, to it's a great question: well, do you believe that viruses are real or not? And if viruses are not real, um, then, you know, how do we explain the kind of, uh, you know, the effectiveness of antivirals? It seems, in other words, I don't see why, you know, we know that, you know, I believe that smallpox was eradicated because I believe that, you know, we understood what smallpox was, small infrastructure, we figured out how to eradicate it. Okay. Um, and I think that that is, uh, in a fact about the natural world that was discovered by scientists. Um, and I, I think that it seems to me implausible to believe that uh, these, these accounts of the structure of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the natural world that have been generated under the uh, you know, actually existing capitalism uh, are therefore our rule line, or, or, or you know, we can afford to kind of jump them, or to relinquish them altogether, uh, because of this. Um, you know, I think that that's, I just find that peculiar claim, and again, it's not clear, I mean, it's also peculiar because it claims that there's, there would be no possible continuity between um, the way in which, you know, our understanding of the way the world works now, Okay, and the way in which we might understand things after the abolishment of capital. And obviously, you know, I said, yes, there will be a radical discontinuity. Okay? But then, absolute discontinuity in metaphysical fiction. Okay? There's no such thing. Okay? There are degrees, and it, it's clear that you may not be able to anticipate the radicality or break or rush from within you know, uh, the status quo, from within the present status quo. From within the present, the present state of things. However, 
That doesn't mean that you won't retrospectively be able to understand uh, how you know the you know um, establish a continuity between um, what was the case before and how the transformation that overturned the previous state of affairs came about. Okay? In other words, our knowledge can undergo radical transformations, okay? But those radical transformations, it seems to me, you know, are based on, are dialectical. Okay? Simple as that. I think they're dialectical. And they have a structure, they have determined structure. That's what the term negation means. Okay? It means that even if, if your understanding of the world undergoes a complete Reconfiguration is terrible. Okay. And I just want to, so however radical the discontinuity, the discontinuity must be retrospectively intelligible. Okay. And it can't be wholly unimaginable from within the present, because then it seems to me if it is wholly unimaginable, then it becomes. Sounds then you have to appeal to kind of uh, things like uh, you know events, kind of radical, you know, radical an instance of radical transcendence. And radical transcendence is not something that you can work with to change the world. Which is why I think it's kind of something that should be kind of you know kept at bay whenever possible. Um, okay, I think I've probably been talking for Okay, uh, that was great. Thanks a lot, Ray. So, uh, so maybe if people have questions, maybe they can come a bit closer so the microphone can pick up the um, the voice and can be heard clearly. Through the chat. Huh? Through the chat. Uh, no, I, I, you hear very well. You, you, you hear well, right? Uh, yes, no, I can, hear, I can hear very well, yeah. Okay, so um, it, uh, that's. You have. Uh, uh, maybe you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, particularly on the, on the last point. Yes, sit down here. Sit down here. Yeah, no, maybe better, better come here just in case because the microphone is. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think I think it will be better. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um... Ah, bueno, yeah, I'm sure. Well, uh, so uh, I'll just put the. It seems that the connection is good, so you can also see uh, Dimitra. <laughs> so it's less impersonal and more personal. Okay. Hi. Hi. I think when you when you said the word retrospectively, I thought that was kind of the key uh, to uh, what I was trying to point at when I was talking about out heaven and the concept of determinate negation that you're looking about. Um, because I don't think that retrospectively. It is, a, it is a problem. I mean, of course, retrospectively, it would be intelligible, but there is a continuity between the different kind of bases, even if there is a, a, a world changing, completely world changing event um, that completely changes the way things function. Obviously, there will be some forms of continuity and some forms in which you can see in the past. Kind of forms that seem to um, what's the word prefigure what is in the present. Um, what I have a problem with is um, the certainty that it is possible that they're co that they're coherent or self. Uh, what's the word? Um, not coherent. Um, discrete. There are discrete things and objects that you can identify in the present and discrete as they are, they can also exist as such after such a transformation. So there can be a continuity but there will be no discreteness of, of those elements. Um, and 
and, and this can only be seen retrospectively. Um, I mean, I, I, the, way, the way that things are to be transformed, um, I don't think it's possible to say or to tell precisely from the present. It is possible to make suggestions. Um, from, for the role of struggle, I certainly don't advocate, um, um, what's the word? Um, you know, pure practice or some, some pure empiricism. Uh, I think that, the, however, that struggles are important <coughs> as events, as this practice that takes place in a particular context in order to uh, produce different understandings of um, social relations and capitalism, and they have done so historically. So, for example, if the communist uh, revolution hadn't happened in Russia and all these things were not transformed, we wouldn't have been able to criticize those particular concepts of revolution. Um, so um, that's where struggles come in and I'm trying to imagine of, ha of, of ways in which struggles mediate uh, whatever conceptions there may be before. So what, what I um, what I'm wary of, wary of is what's the word did I pronounce? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. What I'm wary of is the idea that it is possible to have a complete notion of um, what it could be. Um, I suppose on the on the notion of. Um, Sociality, um, I think there is a disagreement only because I, I certainly don't agree with notion of sociality just reduced to just reduce the community. I think community is just as problematic. But um, I, um, I find uh, I want to dramatize the notion of society as such. Society as such as as a for a form of social organization, um, just by the fact that this is a form of social organization contains within it very spiral relationships. So uh, I want to um, to pose that problem as well uh, as a problem of communism, i.e., that communism is not just a question of a mode of production is not just a question of um, having things is not just a question of being free from hunger, but it is a question of relations of power, and it is it is it is there that this is, this discussion of medicine comes in, because um, yeah, the the the. I suppose the disagreement was with the particular fact that you that you talked about a discrete commodity of antivirus. So I wouldn't be against the idea that the knowledge itself could be transformed in different ways, but I, I, I think that knowledge would be completely produced in different ways. And it, it might not produce antivirals, it might produce something else that would that would that would be you know, I want that possibility open, that it would produce something else that wouldn't be based on this mode of production, it wouldn't be made based on this kind of relationships, it wouldn't be based in a particular social conception of illness. But that, that's kind of what I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I can say, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to say anything else. So. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else should ask a question. Uh, Ray, do you have a chance to bring some responses to the error in the notes text or? Um, 
Well, I've read it and uh, I, I, you know, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I find myself, you know, you know, kind of agreeing with it. I mean, I think it's you know, incredibly lucid, like a really incredibly lucid diagnosis of the problems. Uh, um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think this this idea of like, I think the way in which it kind of identifies this kind of uh, the impasse between, on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, given that. Well, you know, on the one hand, we either have a kind of a, an objectionable monism, where you have this kind of capitalism with this kind of absolute subject. Everything is kind of, you know, puppets of, you know, of, of, of capital. Um, everything we do, you know, everything we can do is already somewhere kind of, you know, um, entirely enveloped by kind of, you know, um, this omnified it monster. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times you have a kind of a dualism. A dualism where you have like, you know, there's capitalism, but there's always this kind of uh, pure, this revolutionary potentiality which is just there, you know, somehow. And I, I, I take it that this is what's objectionable about people like, you know, with like hard and angry and the multitude and stuff. Um, so that I find that, no, I think that's, it's kind of, and, it's so, and so the thing that, um, whether we like it or not, um, even or the way in which we relate to um, the environment, you know, to everything all, everything, all this stuff in our environment, even the stuff that is not kind of, um, you know, really subsumed in the kind of the precise technical sense, which I know Endnotes insist upon, is still nevertheless kind of, uh, you know, um, in this horizon of possibility, which is really kind of determined by capital. Um, so that means that the way in which we orient ourselves, it's really the way in which we orient ourselves towards the, fu the future, and, and, and instead of, in the sense of the, the possibilities embedded in the world around us, still seem to be kind of uh, you know determined by by, by capital. So the question, and that's why it's, it's kind of, we're faced with this, either we, um, you know, on the one hand you have this idea, well, both the idea of some kind of managed transition to, you know, to post-capitalism, as well as the idea of some kind of absolute rupture, seem, um, uh, in, you know, practically inconceivable. It's, it's just not, we, we seem to lack the resources to be able to kind of understand how that might happen, how that might come about. Um, so I think, you know, I, I mean, I think the text is a fantastic kind of crystallization of a dilemma. Um, um, how, but, you know, but it ends on a curious, I mean, I was just wait, it's, it's, it ends rather kind of, uh, Seriously, I mean, um, I mean, the, the problem of the imminent transcendence, okay? the problem of what would an imminent transcendence be, um, given the depths of our subsumption within Campbell's totality. Um, um, and it says, you know, it's a vector problem that lends itself to no end for long and playful manipulation. Um, the play gets boring, invention, boredom is a mode of critique. That's, Yes, it's true, because it, it, it seems that, you know, it's such a, you know, the problem is kind of, uh, you know, couched at a level of abstraction, of, you know, philosophical abstraction, where it seems intractable. Um, and, okay, but I think it's not wholly intractable, and I think some conceptual work, even at this level of abstraction, it's possible to, you know, to actually render it tractable, to break it down. And I think that that will have kind of, you know, positive practical uh, consequences. Um, in other words, uh, it seems, look, I mean, I have no idea, okay, in that, what I think we can insist upon that I do it in the future, but I have no idea kind of transformations um, should or 
should be uh, engaged in of, for, you know, by revolutionaries. Okay, I think, um, so that's why I agree completely that in the theory seems to have seen, became generally incapable of coming up with a set of kind of, you know, satisfactory prescriptions of here's a problem, here's what to do enough to kind of, you know, to solve it. Uh, I also agree about how all these, uh, you know, these existing kind of social forms um, are kind of problematically kind of, you know, um, you know, determined, if not fully constituted by capitalism, and that whatever communism looks like, it would involve this radical reconfiguration, you know, which is you know, difficult for us to kind of imagine. So it's not as if, like, I don't want to make it sound as if my thing, um, you know, you know, these kind of, you know, bourgeois social structures and bourgeois institutions can simply be reformed and kind of preserved or maintained. So I, I completely kind of admit that, you know, they have to be radically reconfigured and, you know, some of them jettisoned, some of them dissolved. Um, but I'm saying that, you know, whatever kind of uh, the, the, the process of jettisoning them and transforming them, in a way, has to rely on an increase resources. I just don't understand how you could, uh, you know, you could do anything in the world, through the world, that wouldn't involve using what is at hand in the world. Um, so, okay, and I also admit that you, the claim that you know, functions are never wholly, you know, can never be wholly abstracted from their thing that you want. Uh, their social impediments, etc., etc. But I think the stratification of function is important. Okay. So in other words, it's it's not. This is why I don't agree that, like, uh, for instance, everything that antivirals do is already kind of you know circumscribed by their current function within you know capitalism. Um, so no, I don't. You know, so I feel. You know, I want to kind of, you know, I want to make it clear that, you know, um, I, I, you know, I admit this kind of uh, a constitutive indeterminacy in, you know, the kind of, uh, in what falls upon a kind of uh, a radical transformation. Um, but you have to determine the indeterminacy. Okay? What, my problem is with vacuous indeterminacy. Or you have like something that is, which is just a kind of like, you know, something, something other, there's a radical alternative that's possible, but we don't know what makes it possible. Okay? That's what I mean by vacuous possibility, and that's what I have a problem with. I don't have a problem with indeterminacy, um, or like, you know, the, uh, the impossibility of, you know, uh, of guarantees. I mean, I you know, freely admit that. Um, but I think it should be very clear about when you about when you say you know, um, that something is indeterminate or undecidable. Okay. Um, you, have to, you have to in a way you have to you have to be more parsimonious about the points of indeterminacy that you allow in your analysis of a situation. Otherwise, it's like if you just lay down your hands and say, you know, something must change, we know not what, we know not how, I think that's uh, yeah, in the recipe for the spirit. So, um, so that's why I think that yes, boredom is a mode of critique. You know, but people may get bored with boredom. It fills the reputation and everything. Like especially not when you realise that these abstractions. You know, nothing is wholly abstract. Well, things that seem wholly abstract can turn out to have concrete efficacy. In other words, you shouldn't prejudge what, you know, when masturbation falls and, you know, you know caution begins. Masturbation, the difference between masturbation and coitus. Because I, I, there's two references to masturbation. Yeah. I'm making it to the arm. Yeah. So, yeah.
Well, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think uh, I don't think we disagree fundamentally at all. Uh, I mean, there's one issue is perhaps that the part of the kind of character of that text is it's a very strange one, and it's um, in a sense it, it involves as, assuming a series of standpoints which I personally believe to be unsustainable. Uh, and kind of seeing what you can do with them. I mean, there's a, it's a sort of, some sort of dialectical kind of uh, attempt, you know, attempt at something sort of dialectical there, right? And it's a, it's a fragment also, so that ending on that silly thing about boredom is, is quite contingent, really, just because the text isn't finished. Um, <laughs> he got bored, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, in terms of the stress on determinate negation, I, I think uh, I would be completely in agreement on that and, and not allowing not just resting with a simple sense of vacuous possibility. And I think that's kind of implied by the other, I mean, you haven't been, you haven't seen the thing you've done today, but we were talking about uh, thinking, but distinguishing between false totality and a, and a determinate totality, or, or indeterminate and, and determinate notions of totality. And it seems to me that uh, if one has a, a determinate notion of the totality, which is to be abolished, then one also must have a sense of determinate negation. The, the, two, the two logically follow, you know, they logically go together. Um, whereas an, an indeterminate notion of totality does imply a, a, a vacuous sense of possibility. So in that sense, yeah, I agree. So questions? <laughs> questions for anyone? Oh, like, um, well, maybe directly, uh, there hasn't been any questions to Ray. Uh, and I, I don't think it's because he answered everything. But, uh, uh, but then, you know, maybe some questions for him, and then we open it. But now, because we're with him, and he was not part of the other ones, you know, maybe it's... Oh, yeah, uh, for, for, for uh, oh, for them. So yes. wait, wait maybe a bit, and... Uh, it relates directly to what was said just now. So. Okay, so please, yeah, go ahead and um, uh, come closer just to the microphone so he can hear you. Um, yeah, is, is um, possibility a necessary precondition for criticism of um. something that exists? Is the possibility of transforming something is it um, is it a necessary preconditions for precondition for criticizing? Um, well, I guess no. This, this uh, might something to be uh, objective or, or acceptable, um, even if you know you can see how to abolish it or can get rid of it. So. So no, I don't, it's not that possibility is the precondition for criticism, um, but criticism, just think that criticism must be more than saying you don't like it, okay? A critique is not just saying you don't like something, okay? It's explaining what's wrong with it, okay? And if you say that something is wrong, then even implicit, there's a, the a people who what the the right, you know, the right state of things, or what would not not be. Um, um, now it may be, it may be that the um, you can be a pessimist and say um, we'll never know, we'll never be able to. You know, like if you're a dawn or something, you can say you know the wrong state of things, everything's wrong, um, and you can any attempt to identify or to determine uh, what would be a right state of things is, you know, temptation to be a lot on cost because that would simply be yet another the kind of identification that would simply perpetuate what's wrong. Um, um, so, no, I admit that I admit it's possible to kind of, to critique, um, you know, Critique need not be worked to the obligation to you know practical transformation. Um, but you know, the Marxist tradition it seems to need to be. It, it, you know, if you say that something is wrong, you say that capitalism is wrong, um, then you know, 
imply that something has been done in order to change or to abolish it or whatever. Um, and if you're committed to changing something, then you're obliged to identify uh, possibility. Now, that, of course, that is very, very difficult. And it's, it's clear that you can't simply accept um, you know, the, uh, the representation of what is possible in the law, okay? Um, which will always be ideological. Both of you, can, you, know, you can't do this, it can't be. Mm. And of course, that very ideological. Okay? Um, but the, one of the tactics of critique is to identify when ideological representation prevents you from, you know, shuts down, you know, um, or preemptively kind of, you know, shuts down the horizon possibility. Um, so in a way you have to kind of argue, you know, part of the task of critique is to keep open is, is not to kind of allow uh, horizon and possibility the kind of the, uh, the uh, distinction between the possible and impossible to be preemptively limited. Um, but you have to do this in a way um, without lapsing into the other temptation, just to say that there's always something else possible, although that something else is inconceivable. That's, that's the kind of thing that the old can say, um, you know, then you end up kind of a utopia, like unimaginable, unrepresentable. Um, and the point is that, the problem with that it seems is that it's all too easy to lapse into a kind of um, you know, ultimately, that kind of complacent embrace of tragic impossibility. The world is terrible, there's nothing to be done, and in fact, the danger to be avoided is trying, thinking you can, can do something. You know, this can, it can be a very conservative position. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so, but I, so I think part of the task of cheek is to be able to kind of to identify um, is to criticize the preemptive shutting down, the ideological foreclosure possibility, but also not to give into the objectification of the city and to uh, you know not to kind of uh, lapse into a kind of you know theological implication of completely you know um, transcend. Um, yeah, I just wanted to respond by saying um, one way in which to kind of rephrase what Ray just said um, is maybe to think that, to kind of flip the terms slightly and sort of say that uh, a kind of adequately determinate criticism is a precondition for adequately determinate possibility. And that maybe the kind of... Uh, uh, the mode of despair comes precisely from the kind of rightly perceived failings of an indeterminate possibility and, and its failure to kind of uh, uh, in any way uh, adequately speak to reality. I have a question that might follow on that, which is for you to um, you know, kind of following on this notion of indeterminacy and determinacy to maybe expand or clarify what you previously have called uh, uh, unsaturated mediation and saturated mediation. Maybe the identifying of these unsaturated mediations can give us room to uh, generate uh, determinate possibilities. Um, yes, well, in a way, I think one of the things that um, I really liked the, uh, the text, uh, the, um, the end of the text, the, first, the, the version of Deja to Eric's text, is because it's very clear about this, about, um, you know, the kind of the, uh, the mistake or, and, you know, what, what's problematic about kind of the uh, this theological absolutization of capital, so the capital saturated with it. Um, so then, 
it once one realizes that this is not, um, you know, kind of a, a viable position or kind of, kind of a confused position, then the task is okay to identify un, you know, unsaturated determination. So and these are the point at which you can distinguish between saturated <coughs> and saturated determination is the point at which um, you can distinguish between um, those possibilities that are kind of, you know, tethered to the perpetuation of the status quo and those which may not be, those which may allow you to kind of to actually transform, you know, to look to change things. Um, in some kind of way, to affect a radical transformation. Um, but it seems that this is a, okay, I take this to be a cognitive task. Okay, I think this involves, um, you know, describing and explaining. It involves describing and explaining um, reality, the world. Uh, and I think, and this is all I mean by kind of insisting on the, uh, you know, the indispensability of you know, what, I guess that's a kind of cognitive abstraction, but what, what I just mean is like kind of, uh, you know, theorizing that tries to understand, um, you know, what things are and how they work. Um, and I, I take this to be, you know, a cognitive task involved like, you know, understanding things about the world. And then it makes, you know, and the difference between having a, an adequate and an inadequate understanding will have immediate, you know, practical consequences. I would say political consequences. Um, so, um, I, I think that's the challenge, is to kind of, uh, once you admit that there's a difference between saturated and non-saturated uh, mediation, then that's where the, you kind of identify possibilities, um, which are not wholly, you know, which are not wholly determined by uh, the status quo, the, the, uh, the existing sort of rules, etc. Um, now, I don't have any such accounts. I've got no idea, um, you know, if you ask me in detail about that. But at least, you know, I think that this is where the work would have to, to be done. Any more questions or um, uh, uh, so there doesn't seem to be any more questions so uh, we might just uh, say thank you very much and uh, it's been very interesting and we will yeah, let you know how it goes and uh, <laughs> And, and if we find some unsaturated mediations, <laughs> we will inform you. Nice. <laughs> I think as wine, as wine kind of, you know, we we'll start already with the wine, but I think as, you know, the party yeah. continues, we might get up somewhere. We might get saturated, but at the same time, we might get unsaturated replies to you. Passing my glass through the internet of objects. Thanks so much, Ray. Thanks okay, well, thank you guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Cheers. Cool. Okay. So we've been touch. Yeah. Okay, hey, cheers. Bye bye. 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 <laughs> so, would you like to <laughs> uh, dance? Uh, uh, dance. Or... You, get, you have some music. What we thought about. You have some music in your in your computer. <laughs> Uh, or you want to uh, try to find out those unsaturated mediation right now here? <laughs> or you, what? Uh, what? Uh, I guess the music is uh, Yeah. Uh, so yeah. we are more than in time. We are before the time, which might maybe have to do with the wet time. Yeah, it was really a lot of the